Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the swamp. As you can see, I'm joined by a great crowd, a great crowd of patriots, Americans here fighting for the American people. And I want you to know that this meeting, this gathering, this message today is about the American people. We're not here to talk about brinksmanship. No one is here interested in a pause in government funding. What we're interested in is taking the Biden boot off the neck of the American people. In the five weeks I've been gone, just give you a quick summary, card check rolling out of the Department of Labor. The Department of Justice, of course, continues to prosecute their political enemies while leaving criminals run rampant across our streets. The president disrespected and insulted the people of Hawaii after their houses were burned down. Alejandro Mayorkas is literally daring us to impeach him. He can't be bothered with whatever the law says. The people, that, the people that I represent, American citizens, are now being forced to compete against workers, people coming illegally in the, in the form of hundreds of thousands every single month across our southern border. The people in the city that I represent, the capital city of Harrisburg, are dying from fentanyl this week. And there's not a damn thing being done about it. Not a damn thing being done about it. We are sick of the theater. This isn't a, we're tired of the Washington theater. Go home and tell them anything. Tell them we're working for them and all that stuff. Nothing we're doing is changing their lives. A government that tells you you can't buy the stove you want or drive the car you want is a government of tyranny. And there's no freedom in America. We're not interested in a continuing resolution that continues the policies and the spending of the Biden Schumer Pelosi era. And we're not going to vote for it. We didn't vote for it last December, and we're not going to vote for it now. So we're here to tell you the American people are sick of it. They can't afford, a, afford their electricity bill. They can't afford the gas bill. And they damn sure can't afford the grocery bill. We're here to put our foot down and say to this place right here, it stops now. The power of the purse is in the legislature. And the way you stop all this craziness of the Biden administration, the tyranny of the Biden administration, is to stop giving them money. With that, I turn it over to the great senator from Florida, Mr. Thank Scott. You. Thank you, Chair Perry. So, so first off, let's look at what's going on here. We've had a 1.8% increase in our population since 2019. The budget's up 55%. Would anybody do that with a personal life? Nobody would do that. That's $400,000 of new spending per new person. It's unconscionable what they're doing. We're never gonna get inflation under control. We got, we've got, now if you're gonna get a mortgage, it's over seven and a half percent. If you're gonna get a car, your interest rate's at the highest in 23 years. If you have a credit card, the highest interest rate on credit cards, I think in history. So the Biden administration, their economics is hurting all of our families. I th thank God for what the Freedom Caucus is doing in the House. If they wouldn't stand up, if they don't stand up, nobody's standing up. They stood up on the debt ceiling, and they fought for a great bill. Unfortunately, it didn't end up that way, but they fought for a great bill. We've got to stop this insanity. On top of that, in my state, we've had two hurricanes. I can't make sure the federal government's funded to even take care of disasters. And the federal secretary of agriculture won't even give money to my farmers and my ranchers for the hurricane 11 months ago. So I have a bill, then we're going to get that done also. But thank God for these people standing up here, or this will not change. How about turn it over to Chip? Thanks, sir. Well, thank you, Senator. Thank you to my friend, the chairman of the Freedom Caucus, Scott Perry, and all my colleagues here and friends who are representing uh, people from across this country who are fed up. They're fed up of a government that's out of control. And here's the thing. Our founding fathers, in creating this country, created separation of powers. It is incumbent upon those of us with election certificates, particularly in the House of Representatives, but also the Senate, to stand up at this end of Pennsylvania Avenue and hold the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and the executive branch accountable. A president and an executive branch that is out of control. My question for my colleagues, particularly my Republican colleagues, is when is it enough? When is it enough? to stand up and do what you campaign to do and use the power of the purse to stop this administration from trampling the American people. Spending is out of control. 
federal government will spend two trillion more than it takes in this year to fund the very agencies and programs at war with the American people. Inflation is opposed to 17% across the board tax on Americans. We've added one and a half trillion dollars in debt since the so-called debt deal. We are now spending more on interest on the debt than we are in defending the United States of America. The Department of Defense is threatening our national defense by turning our military into a social engineering experiment wrapped in a uniform. COVID tyranny is rearing its ugly head again. It was announced today, CIA whistleblowers told the COVID Select Committee that the CIA bribed its own analysts to deny the Wuhan lab leak theory. Healthcare system broken by Washington and big insurance while average Americans foot the bill. Energy, we're destroying our ability to have reliable energy. The Inflation Reduction Act's $1.2 trillion handout to unreliable wind and solar, big corporations and rich leftists, and the Chinese Communist Party remain in effect right now. DOJ is advancing a politicized form of justice, targeting former President Trump, targeting dads like Scott Smith in Loudoun County, which thankfully Governor Yunkin just pardoned. Mark Houck, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, for defending his son. And perhaps most of all as a Texan, and for all of us, particularly a few New Yorkers these days, perhaps people are paying attention to a border that is so devastatingly broken that Americans are dying. How many moms do I have to sit next to in another round table in Texas who lost their son or their daughter to fentanyl? How many migrants have to die in the back of a tractor trailer in San Antonio? How many have to die in the Rio Grande? How many girls have to get sold in the sex trafficking trade before this body will wake up and stop an out of control president? Enough. Why would we fund that? That's my question for the Republican leadership. Why will you fund that? Let me be very clear. I will not continue to fund a government at war with the American people. We are here to change it. It is time to end it. And I'm proud to stand with these patriots to do that. I'm going to yield to the senator from Utah, Mike Lee. We're $33 trillion in debt for one reason. We're doing it wrong. This is how we do it. This is how we spend in Washington. We tie every single spending item to every other spending item. And then members of Congress are told, you've got to pass all of it in order to get any of it. You want to fund the troops, you want to fund Social Security, you want to fund this, that, or the other, then you have to fund everything else in between with no opportunity for individual input. So this comes about usually as we approach the end of a spending period, as we now are, on September 30th, we'll run out of money at midnight. At some point in the days leading up to that, typically what will happen is this. A small handful of appropriators will write something up with a push from the law firm of Schumer, McConnell, McCarthy, and Jeffries. <laughs> and it will materialize. Just shazam, here you go. Uh, from out of nowhere, here it is. You, usually there's just a few hours to go. You've got to pass this thing. And if you don't, there will be a shutdown. If there's a shutdown, we will blame you for that. But hey, vote how you want. You will have no opportunity to amend this. You will have no opportunity to read it, to understand what's in it, to share it with your constituents, to object to it, to improve it, to cut it. Nothing. So the law firm of Schumer, McConnell, Pelosi, uh, Schumer, McConnell, McCarthy, and Jeffries keeps changing the law firm. It, it keeps running the bills. And what happens is almost every member of Congress is cut out of that process. And what that means is that the hundreds of millions of people that most members of rep Congress represent are in turn cut out of the process. This process will continue. And its deadly deficit and debt ushering consequences will continue to devastate America until it no longer works. But it will work as long as members vote for this. It's time for the American people to expect more. It's time to expect an actual process and for members of Congress to have a say. It's not my privilege to uh, turn the microphone over to somebody whose hairstyle I recently chose to emulate. A gift to the American people, an American patriot, Kevin Roberts, the president of the Heritage Foundation. What, he gets the credit for the hairstyle? Yes, I, I, I get credit for the hairstyle. I'm, I'm here to talk about 
the millions of Americans who, who don't care about a conversation about a shutdown. They don't care about a conversation about a continuing resolution. To them, that's just DC speak that gets in the way of what they're feeling. They're feeling on the one hand, the greatest inflation that we have felt in this country in decades, a direct result, a direct result, not just of overspending, which is what a short-term continuing resolution would continue to do, but cowardice, political cowardice by men and women who are elected to do better than that. If you want the American people to continue to be disaffected, disillusioned, desperate for some sort of solution, then pass a continuing resolution. Talk about a shutdown, but in fact, that's not necessary. The House of Representatives mustered 218 votes for a great piece of legislation that was fiscally conservative. And then on another occasion, they mustered 218 votes for another great piece of legislation, which my friend, fellow Texan, Chip Roy talked about, and that is securing the southern border. Let that be the guide. That's the solution here. This only in D.C. would this be complicated. And so for us at the Heritage Foundation, we're really motivated by ordinary people, as all of these men and women behind me are. And I think about our new friend, Elise Tambuga, in Texas, who just in March of this year lost her mother and her seven-year-old daughter because a human smuggler with 11 illegal aliens in his truck got into an accident with the two of them. Passing a continuing resolution funds the lawlessness and the Biden insecure border. It is imperative that we, we think more boldly than this. And in fact, thinking boldly in this case is just common sense. So the Heritage Foundation is very grateful to stand with all these patriots behind us. And I'm grateful to turn this over to our friend, Congressman Ralph Bowman of South Carolina. Thanks, John. Thank you, Evan. You know, um, I, I now believe that most politicians in Washington, D.C. don't believe in gravity. They just don't believe in gravity. Uh, and you know, and I, I, you, can, you can disagree with gravity, and it's, it's not the fall that gets you, it's the sudden stop. Well, we're on a sudden stop with the economy here, folks. National issues of overspending, I'm tired of it. As this group behind me has said, and I'm not going to read you all the list, y'all know the overspending, uh, but I'm tired of politicians campaigning on one thing and then and, and not having the courage to back it up. Anybody, any Republican, and I don't even mention the Democrats, I know they're, they're bought and sold anyway, they're going to vote for this thing. Anybody that votes for a continued resolution funds all of this stuff that is absolutely insane and putting us in uh, dire conditions. And how many people, as has been mentioned, have to die on the border? How many people have to get the phone call that I got? A good friend of mine's son was shot and killed. He was a police officer for 24 months. How long are we going to have to kick me on our back? Well, folks, now is the time. Now is the time that we stand up. And whatever it is, we got rolled on the debt ceiling. We're not going to get rolled again now. We're going to use our votes to defund as many things as we can. CR, I'm not voting for, as many aren't, because it funds all the bad things that we say we are against. So I hope you will report this. This country, economic security is national security. If not now, when? I call on Jenny Beth Martin. I'm Jenny Beth Martin with Tea Party Patriots Action. I'm here today on behalf of the 300, I'm sorry, I'm here today on behalf of the 3 million supporters and members of Tea Party Patriots Action who support the House Freedom Caucus because the HFC is fighting to break the endless cycle of tax and spend, borrow and spend, and spend and spend. Because the Freedom Caucus knows we simply cannot sustain the reckless spending. We need to cut spending. I'm also here today because the House Freedom Caucus is fighting to get the Biden administration to do its job and to enforce our immigration laws. The Democrat governor of Massachusetts de just declared a state of emergency. The Democrat governor of New York is begging Washington for help. The Democrat mayor of New York City says illegal immigration is going to destroy the city. All because the Biden administration won't keep our nation's borders secure. So I have a simple message on behalf of our three million supporters. No security, no funding. 
add the language of the Secure, Secure the Border Act to the continuing resolution and cut spending or don't expect to see it pass. No security, no funding. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Jenny Beth, good job. I'm Congressman Dan Bishop. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the media, do you remember in January when we took four days to see the speaker, do you recall it being said that we were going to, those that four days of delay was going to horrifically delay the work of the Republican majority in the House? Is it really possible that we are now standing eight months later and do not have a spending plan that 218 members are prepared to support on the floor? Can you possibly account for that if you are the person responsible for leading? Why is it that every tough leadership proposal, every tough initiative that has been formed and offered and adopted in this Republican majority has come out of these folks. The House Freedom yeah. Caucus, the Limit Save Grove proposal, HR2, very substantial. Why is that? Where are the other ideas from the remainder of the Republican conference? Are we really walking into this month, this return from recess, a couple of weeks out from the spending deadline and being told that we've got to support a clean CR? Really? I thought over the debt ceiling debacle and there's one idea that came out of it that epitomized the problem that we face. It was that the speaker said that he, on his own, unilaterally made the decision not to move the debt ceiling out to the first quarter of 2024 when it would have been, played a central role in our next presidential election and the debate associated with that. But he, on his own initiative, decided to push it out to the beginning of the next year, 2025. Why? Because he was concerned about entering into another negotiation with Joe Biden. Leave aside how astonishing that is in itself. But how does one who is leading anticipate in a divided government moving forward on policy issues critical to the American people unless there's a negotiation, unless there's an opportunity to negotiate? The opportunity to negotiate on behalf of the American people arrives again right now. And leadership means seizing that opportunity and doing something for the American people. Passivity, standing still, giving in, telling us that the Senate will jam us, that does not answer the call. Right. Hey, yes. What's that, I yield to Wade Miller. Hi, thanks for coming today. Um, I'm a Marine veteran, and I hate to have to say this, but I would not want my son or daughter to serve in today's military. Uh, I say that even though one of my grandmothers served in World War II, both of my grandpa grandfathers served in World War II, my father served in Vietnam. I did three deployments in Iraq. Just one example of why I feel this way. Right now, General C.Q. Brown has been nominated to be the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Aside from serious command and readiness failures, General Brown has openly advocated for systemic racism and sexism in promotions. That's a clear violation of the 14th Amendment. What would happen if any other senior officer tried to predicate promotions to preference white males? They'd be court-martialed. This man is being promoted. Why are we funding that? Uh, over a third of the senior military officers that are currently being held have espoused similar views. Uh, we have a weaponization of the DOJ and the uh, FBI. Political opponents are being targeted, and Americans with different opinions are treated differently than those with regime-friendly viewpoints, showing very real constitutional due process concerns once again. And I fully support impeachment, uh, but impeachment is not a replacement for accountability through government funding and the power of the purse. We find ourselves hearing from those on the left right now, the very same people who recently shut down American communities for well over a year, who destroyed tens of millions of families, small businesses, schools, and churches. They will block government funding if it happens to fix many of these problems. That's problematic. Republicans should challenge them to do so by putting forward a CR that legitimately addresses these concerns, 
uh, including border security, COVID tyranny, and the national debt. Finally, I applaud all of those conservatives standing here who are signaling that enough is enough, that it is finally time for Republicans to take a stand to protect Americans. And with that, I'll turn it over to Representative Clyde. Thank you, Wade. You know, back in January, we fought to fundamentally alter the way this institution works. We fought to restore the people's house. And while we were successful in delivering transformational change, our fight doesn't end there. In the early summer months, we fought against the Biden-McCarthy Fiscal Irresponsibility Act because this spendthrift deal was disastrous for our nation's financial future. Now we're faced with the battle of funding the government. And just as before, we're not interested in giving up when the going gets tough. We're not interested in allowing Washington to revert back to serving the swamp instead of serving the American people. And we certainly aren't interested in rubber stamping the big government socialist agenda of Joe Biden, Chuck Schumer, and Nancy Pelosi or their out of control spending levels and woke policies from the last Congress. The country gave House Republicans the majority to change the course of Congress greenlighting a so-called clean or unqualified or blind CR is completely out of the question. It would endanger the Republican majority and endanger Speaker McCarthy's leadership. We will not kick the can of addressing excessive government spending down the road again in order to buy the Uniparty more time to produce yet another horrendous backroom deal. Such a decision would not only lead us to fail in delivering on our promises, but would ultimately fail the American people who sent us here to fix this broken system. As a new and conservative appropriator, my top priority remains passing each of the 12 appropriation bills in a conservative and fiscally responsible manner, meaning true FY22 top level spending, just as we vowed to do. If our Republican colleagues share this goal, then it's past time that we put in the work to achieve it. Now, in terms of a short-term solution, I will oppose any CR that fails to include the qualifications that my House Freedom Caucus colleagues and I have outlined. That means the significantly increased border security of H.R. 2. After all, we all voted for it. Eliminating the weaponization of the Department of Justice and ending the woke policies that continue to undermine our military's combat readiness. Furthermore, I will also oppose any additional blank check for Ukraine. We simply cannot continue funding wasteful, reckless, and woke policies that are destroying our great nation. Capitulating to the swamp is not an option. It's time to fight and win for real change on behalf of the American people. I'd now like to turn it over to the President of Freedom Works, Adam Wren. The single greatest threat to the United States is not China, it's not AI, it's our debt. It's $32 trillion today. In less than 10 years, it's $50 trillion. Are we all going to be back here in 10 years dealing with $50 trillion in debt? We know this problem is coming. Trans just simply transferring all this debt to future generations is absolutely immoral. It's absolutely immoral. I I'm so proud of these folks for coming here and actually checking on this issue. It's a thorny issue. But what's really ironic to me is that a lot of these folks back here I'd say a lot of millennial voters aren't exactly supporting them, right? They tend to vote more left. This is the only group in town that's actually defending the millennial interests. They're standing here for future generations that don't even support them. That's crazy. But I applaud them for doing this. I applaud them for stepping up for future voters. So 10 years, we don't have to have another stupid press conference about our debt. Let's actually start dealing with it now. So I'm going to turn it over to Congressman Good. Thank you, Adam, and thank you to my colleagues, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. You know, we have a Republican majority, and yet we are on the verge of a $2 trillion deficit with a Republican majority and about to spend $7 trillion this fiscal year. We don't need a Republican majority to do that. Right. January was about us not doing what we've always done and expecting we'd get a different result. January was about us, when we have the majority, not passing major spending bills with the majority of Democrat votes. And yet, we had a, a coalition of conservative policy making going on through April until the failed Responsibility Act. And what was the failed Responsibility Act? That was when Republicans and Democrats came together 
minus the people behind me, came together and raised the debt ceiling to an unlimited amount through January of 25. As much as we in Congress can come together and gleefully spend until January of 25. And there's one thing Congress is good at, it's spending money. And that's why we have, as others have noted, $32 trillion national debt on our way to 33, probably 35 by the time this Congress is finished, a, a year and a half from now, over $100,000 per American citizen. With a Republican majority, when we campaigned on fiscal responsibility, when we campaigned on cutting our spending, when we campaigned on fighting for Republican policies and reversing the harmful Biden, Pelosi, Schumer policies under which the American people are suffering today. And the days of reckless spending without consequence are over. We're seeing record inflation, 40 year high inflation because of the massive spending. We're seeing interest rates raised in a futile attempt to combat the inflation that we've caused through our spending, and those interest rates are further crushing the American people. And yes, we're seeing our credit rating lowered for only the second time in history, which further causes interest rates to go up and further oppresses the American people. And yet we cannot get our Republican conference to come together and pass 12 appropriation bills on time that cut our spending with only the modest goal of going to 2022 levels overall 2019 pre-COVID for non-defense discretionary. That is a modest, embarrassing low $115 billion cut when we're running a $150 billion monthly deficit. Yeah. There's some disagreement on how far we should go. There's some disagreement on what policies to put first, but fight for something for the American people. Here, here. They didn't elect a Republican majority to cave to the Democrats once again. I call on the speaker we call on the speaker to be a historic transformational speaker that for once stares down the white house stares down the senate and stands strong for the american people and says no we can pass all of our appropriation bills maybe not by no september 30 unless you know what we work you guys are ready to work the last We're week here. in september right don't send us home that last week in september keep us here to pass our spending bills advancing republican priorities and cutting back to the pre-covid levels and then if Schumer wants another Schumer shutdown, let him have it and let him defend it to the American people. So I stand here with my colleagues today in solidarity to fight for the American people. And I yield now to Dave McIntosh of Club for Growth. You all have heard uh, very eloquent remarks today, so I'll keep mine brief. Woke deficit spending is ruining this country, and it's time that it stopped. These men and women are the leaders carrying that message. Club for Growth will stand behind them as they work with Speaker McCarthy to bring forward a bill that stops deficit spending and runaway ruinous deficit. I commend them and I thank them for their effort. Well, I want to thank you all for being here and thank you to my colleagues. You know, the American people are sick and tired of funding the priorities of Washington elites. The American people are sick and tired of a woke and weaponized Justice Department. And the American people are sick and tired of a border that is so porous that we have hundreds of thousands of people coming across monthly. We have 85,000 children that are unaccounted for. I was just in Tucson and I went south to the border. You have miles and miles of fence. And roughly every quarter of a mile, our government our government has cut holes in the fence. The so-called deer crossing, there was no deer tracks. I'm a country boy from Tennessee. There was footprints, there was carpet shoes used by the cartel, and there was paraphernalia. I found birth control of a woman who couldn't afford to pay her fare, so she had to work it off on her journey. These feckless policies of this inept, corrupt administration, we cannot, we will not fund. It is time that we draw a line in the sand and say, Hell no. This economy is like the Titanic. It's on a course. There's a collision ahead, and if we don't correct course, the outcome will be catastrophic. I yield to... Uh, no, I represent Numbers USA, which is a grassroots organization that focuses exclusively on immigration. We represent over 7 million Americans in every state and every congressional district. 
Regardless of whether you are a Democrat or a Republican, or you live in a red district or a blue district, the border crisis affects all of us. But the people it affects most of all are low-income, working-class Americans and recent immigrants who have to compete with illegal aliens for jobs, scarce state and federal resources, healthcare resources, and affordable housing. Their kids are in overcrowded public schools, their wages are stagnating, and their grocery bill is soaring. The House of Representatives has already passed the solution to the border crisis, H.R. 2, the Secure the Border Act, but it's languishing in the Senate. The only leverage the House now has to move H.R. 2 across the finish line is the constitutional power of the purse. Congress cannot continue to fund this administration's efforts to escort as many illegal aliens into the United States as possible under the guise of either illegal parole or catch and release. To do so would make Congress complicit in the open border policies of this administration. The House must attach H.R. 2 in its entirety to the spending bill and pass that. No security, no funding. Thank you very much, and I am turning this over to Kiso. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, you have heard very eloquently from my colleagues. I appreciate the senators being here to support us. But this is the opportunity for the House of Representatives to do its job. I wanted. I just got back from uh, the, what we euphemistically call the August recess. I want to share two uh, things with you. First of all, last Thursday night, I was with a group of my constituents who are so frustrated with the federal government. The spending, the tyranny against the citizens, it was amazing to me to hear what they are so frustrated, even angry about. The second thing is I visited several food pantries in my district over the recess, both of them, plus one just outside of my district, told me that their surge under Bidenomics is worse than the COVID surge. Think about that. Bidenomics is torching the American family. Those are two main street stories that I want you to focus on because we can talk theory, we can talk esoteric theory all day long, but our families are hurting. Let's get the job done. Uh, let's do our job in the House of Representatives. And I will turn this over to Andy Roth. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Roth. I'm president of the State Freedom Caucus Network. Uh, my job is to help state lawmakers create state freedom caucuses all across the country. No security, no funding is the only sane and responsible path forward in a country where we are $32 trillion in debt. Hundreds of thousands of illegal aliens are crossing the border unimpeded and our justice system is weaponized against the Biden regime's political opponents. Pretending that these are not existential problems and trying to paper over, paper over these issues with increased earmark spending and yet another blank check for Ukraine is actually insane. To the House Freedom Caucus members behind me, all of our State Freedom Caucus members are four square behind you. We have 135 state lawmakers in 11 states representing millions and millions of hardworking Americans. In Arizona, Illinois, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Idaho, Georgia, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, Louisiana, and Mississippi, our members are standing and cheering for you, letting their constituents know who the real fighters are in DC and who is standing in the way. We all know you will stay strong and committed, and we thank you for it. We're growing the team of your supporters. Let's go. Clay Higgins. I thank you all for being here, and I appreciate my colleagues for standing with us today. Before you, ladies and gentlemen, Americans at home, you have the fighters within the House of Representatives. We're the men and women that represent the point of the spear. When we speak your voice, we feel your pain. The $33 trillion of debt is crippling our nation's future. It's got to be stopped. We have to change the trajectory of spending 
and and we have written 12 appropriations bills republicans under republican majority some of us worked on these bills for over a year these bills are set to be passed there's a bit of a disagreement right now we have faith many of us have faith that we can yet overcome that difference and pass these appropriations bills that have transformative conservative language representative of everything that needs to happen to restore America's stability and financial security, our border security, sanity within our federal government, to push back on the weaponized federal government bureaucracies that are focused and targeted on American citizens. We have, <laughs> we have an opportunity to save our country or lose it. And, and a lot of that fight is gonna happen in the next two weeks. A continuing resolution we oppose. We already voted no on the omnibus. They're asking us to support a CR that represents Democrat policies and insane levels of spendings that we've already voted no on. So we, we are prepared to work with our colleagues within the Republican conference to come together ultimately and pass these 12 appropriation bills. We're working right now our offices and our staffs to make that happen. We, we call upon the American people to stand with us. If we don't change the trajectory of spending, you young Americans are not going to have a country. If two trillion dollars of deficit spending this year, so the Treasury prints Treasury bonds, 20-year Treasury bonds, we sell those bonds to other nation states. That's how you finance your deficit spending. What are you going to do in 2043? What are you young Americans going to do in 20 years when your federal government, with the full faith and credit of your United States Treasury, are constitutionally bound to service $2 trillion of debt in that year? Be one-fifth of your federal revenue. You'll have no discretionary spending. The total amount of discretionary spending that we're arguing over right now is less than the, than the deficit that we've accumulated this year. You young Americans better pay attention to who's actually fighting for you. It's the men and women that stand with me here today. Every gentleman coming to speak behind me, pay close attention because he uses words with with many syllables. <laughs> Tom Fitton, step forward, please, sir. Thank you. I'll see you later. Uh, I'm Tom Fitton. I'm president of Judicial Watch, America's leading government watchdog organization. Uh, we have a simple request for Congress, do your job. It's not enough to do investigations and reports. We need to stop the government corruption and abuse uh, that is so concerning to the American people. Uh, in this new budget fight, or basically the old budget fight that we're being asked to pretend is new, uh, there's an inflection point. Are we going to continue to fund Republicans in the House the wild abuse by the Biden administration of its political opponents, the mass censorship of tens of millions of Americans, the border invasion we've heard so much about, and the other wild abuses of power that are right now fully funded with Congress and I don't know what we're talking about with a clean CR. I see a dirty CR, a CR that will fund the worst, the dirty politics and corruption in our federal government. And there's a positive moral obligation right now, not next year, but right now, to stop the abuses, the effort to jail Trump on pretextual, unprecedented charges in a way never seen before in American history. An obligation to stop right now the Biden administration censorship of tens of millions of Americans. The obligation to stop right now the illicit use of tax monies to fund abortions in our military and elsewhere. The uh, right We need to stop right now the attack on children through the promotion of transgender extremism. We need to stop right now the lack of serious investigation into the Biden administration corruption, specifically Biden corruption. We need a Justice Department or a special counsel that has confidence of the American people. All of these issues can be addressed in this continuing resolution 
And if they don't want to address it, that suggests to me those who, for, for, who vote for it are on the side of corruption and those who oppose it are on the side of justice. Thank you very much. All right, we'll take a few of your questions. I got a question for Congressman Roy. Uh, sure. Matt Gates said that you're the custodian of his hard copy of the McCarthy deal. Do you have that? Can you just enumerate for us, you know, what's on huh? that that is making line? Gates say that he's, you know, out of out of line with the agreement? It sounds yeah. like this governs it a lot. Yeah, this question's been asked and answered. I mean, uh, we we had a a. Uh, meeting of the minds and agreement with the speaker in January. We all know what that uh, is represented. Matt articulated a lot of those things uh, today uh, on the floor of the House. Uh, the fact of the matter is, let's be very clear, um, we talked about reducing spending. That was a part of the agreement. We all know that and we talked about it publicly and we haven't done that, period, full stop. We haven't done what we agreed to do. We talked about pass passing a balanced budget. We talked about actually passing a budget. We haven't done that, right? We talked about having uh, term limits, bring the bill to the floor. We haven't done that. So that's what Matt was getting at. And the point here is, you know, we can go back and talk about the agreement, but the point here is the American people, the people suffering at home, expect us to do our job. That's the point that we're dealing with here in September. So just one follow-up then, or two rather. One, is there a hard copy of that? Like, I just would love to just kill that. Is there or is there? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. I've talked about that. That's been asked and answered since January. Okay, and are you of the same mindset as him that if there's a CR introduced that you'll motion to make Right now, we're here presenting what we believe is the right path forward to, to make sure this country is actually saved from deficits, from wide open borders, from a woke military that's wep and a DOJ that's weaponized against the American people. We're here to stand up for them. And if Democrats don't want to work with us on that, if some of our Republican colleagues don't want to work with us on that, that's on them to figure out what's going to happen on October 1. But under no circumstances should we have a dirty CR, a clean CR, uh, so-called, uh, on October 1. That should not be on the table. I have a question. I just know you all are talking about the power of the purse and how you have a jurisdiction over government agencies. And I want to know if you have a plan for the FBI's weaponization of government against the American people. The FBI falls under the Department of Justice, which falls under the Commerce, Justice, and Science Appropriation. And I would imagine, can't speak for everybody, but I think generally speaking, we do not want to fund them at the current level. We want to send them a message that they obviously have too much money. They're weaponized and using the taxpayers' money against the taxpayers. We're yeah, done with that. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. I want to ask you, some of, some of you guys have come out against linking and impeachment inquiry with the funding fight. Um, where, where do you stand on that? Are you, are you comfortable taking an official position on that? I think and we agree with the speaker that impeachment is not, it should not be done for political reasons. If the facts take us to that location, Location, then that's where they should take it. But it has nothing to do with the debt, the deficit, the, the outrageous spending, the inflation that's crushing American families. Those are two separate issues, and they should be dealt separately with separately. The American people should not be forced to suffer under this economy where they can't afford their interest rates, credit card payments are through the roof, can't afford gas, electric, food, because Biden needs to be to have an impeachment inquiry done on it. That, that's the president has earned that himself. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Do you think House Speaker from McCarthy should have done a House floor vote before launching this impeachment inquiry? I think the impeachment inquiry is long overdue. Personally, I'm on the Oversight Committee, and I think that any other citizen that had stacked up against him what the president had stacked up against him right now would already be in court. And are you concerned yes, about... Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you for holding this press conference. Can you give us an update on where you all are at on the defense appropriations bill that's in rules pretty soon and on the floor later this week? Let me be clear. We wanted to, the Republican Party always wants to defend the nation and always wants to support our military. As a guy who spent 38 years in uniform, I understand that. But what we're not going to do is say that we're going to pass things without knowing what the plan is and knowing that it leads to the increased spending that is crippling our citizens. We're not going to do that. So we're going to have to see the whole plan is the point. Yes, ma'am. About these spending issues, about the appropriations bills, what progress was made over these past couple of years? Well, apparently it's not enough progress. It's not enough progress because we're standing here before you today. We had conversations, but we need to get to it. We have a few days left, and we need to get to it. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves. I'm sure every one of these folks, including Senate candidates, would be willing to roll up their sleeves and get to work and finish this deal. We want to pass appropriations bills. That is our desire. We want them to be righteous, we want them to be the right number, and we want them to recognize 
the failed policy of the Biden administration, and the crushing, crippling inflation that it's causing for our citizens back at home. You've got a question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, yeah. Um, the speaker had previously said that, uh, that you know, he warned that, in that the Biden investigations would maybe get tied up in a shutdown. Um, do you think we'll launch the impeachment inquiry? Are you worried at all? I'm not worried at all. These people are ready to work. Three hundred six. We're going to be here working. If there's if there's going to be an impasse in spending, we're going to be here working on that, right? So we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can do two things at one time. So we can work on that, or we're working on the inquiry. That's so what we would do. If he's going to use it as leverage, we're going to let the American people know that's the leverage. All right, we're going to let them know. I don't suspect he's going to do that. So, and, and, and there's, and I'm making making no claims that he would do that. I don't think it'd be appropriate. All right, last question. Yes, ma'am. What actual evidence do you have, as opposed to allegations, to show to the American public that would merit an actual impeachment inquiry of? Joe Biden and prove that today isn't just about some of you oh, I don't successfully know. bullied Speaker McCarthy for the sake of enacting political revenge. Uh, Th this for the isn't about of political Trump. revenge. We have the bank accounts. We can see, ma'am, you can see that the homes that the Bidens own can't be afforded on a, on a congressional or Senate salary. You also understand that it's not normal for family members to receive millions of dollars from overseas interest. Those things aren't normal. That's not normal to have 20 self shell country, companies. These things are not normal, and it alludes to not only just widespread corruption, but money laundering, if not influence peddling itself. And we also have the president, on, or the vice president at the time, on record saying that the prosecutor was fired. Well, son of a bitch, the prosecutor was fired, right? Because the prosecutor was going after the, the company that his son was working on. That's what we have. If you can't see that, if you are, if you are that blunt, look, I'll turn it well, over to you. The American people can't see that. They I'll, think it's political it's revenge. It's because you don't report on it. No, 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 you're not, We're I don't think, reporting on it today. With I'm not respect. sure how you know what the American people think, but here's what they might wonder. Actually, if you're a federal prosecutor, you would be asking yourself, how can there not have been an indictment for a FARA violation against Hunter Biden? How can there possibly, I, my understanding, and con, uh, discussions with staff have confirmed my impulse, that this would be very much the, the basis of a foreign, of a, um, a, a foreign Corrupt Practices Act investigation, uh, given the circumstances that we know. The question is, you know, it's funny, after we come out of the events of, for the, the John Durham, for example, testified to, to our committees about how investigations proceeded through our investigative agencies without proper predication. It's not that you have to prove the case. It's not that you understand to this point, there's not been a single subpoena to a Hunter Biden bank account or a Joe Biden bank account or any other Biden family member's bank account. Because until, because an impeachment in, until an impeachment inquiry commences, that's not a jurisdictional possibility. Well, it would be stretching jurisdiction to do that. But there's ample predication at this point in time based on that very unusual set of circumstances, which is for no apparent payment for expertise or services rendered. Biden family members writ large received over $20 million. That we, now, know of. that we know of. It is very simple for someone just to insist there's an absence of evidence. And, and but you, if you can look in the face of that and contend that, that's, you know, anyone has a right to their opinion. What they can't do is change the facts. And I invite you to go to the website clyde.house.gov forward slash Biden crime family, and you will see all the evidence from the oversight committee. You will see all the evidence. And if you're willing to read it, I think you'll be convinced. Thank you all. Thank you. So what point are you going to be vacating Kevin McCarthy since he's doing absolutely nothing? <laughs>